Hello and welcome to this webinar on digital technologies in the lives of children and young people. My name is Sonia Livingstone and I'm a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at LSE. And um, I would like to say first thank you to everyone who's attending this webinar. Um, and I think people are entering uh, now. Please note that this webinar is being recorded um, and live streamed to Facebook. Uh, so to be part of the webinar, we, we assume you agree. So here in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics, we research how changes in media and communication shape and are shaped by social, cultural, political, economic and historical developments. And our concerns are with inequalities, discrimination, representation, voice, violence, and a host of further issues in an unevenly mediated society. Among our various projects with my colleague here um, today, Dr. Maria Stoliver, I lead the theory work package of a European Commission Horizon 2020 funded network called CORE. CORE stands for Children Online Research and Evidence and it has partners from nine European countries and you're going to hear more about it today. So this webinar is part of the theory work package of CORE and it follows recent webinars on the topics of well-being and digital skills and literacies and you can watch these webinars again on the CORE webpage and there are more webinars to come. So over the last decade, we have really witnessed major transformations in children and young people's access to and immersion in the digital environment. On the one hand, we've seen considerable attention to the risks and safety issues that arise. And on the other, there's been attention to the positive ways in which society hopes children will and can engage in actors in a digital world, recognizing how information and communication technologies are valued for the opportunities they bring to today's young generations. Today, we're going to discuss work which seeks to integrate these themes so that we develop a holistic account of children's digital lives and recognizing um, that increasingly the lives of children in Europe are becoming what we might call digital by default, especially exacerbated by COVID-19. In the past year, the European Commission has funded four major research projects projects, well, I should say three major research projects and one coordination and support action as part of its um, Horizon 2020 programme on the impact of technological transformations on children and youth. The programme, the projects are called DigiMatex, DigiGen, YSkills and Core. And I'm delighted that we have with us today the principal investigators of each of those projects to discuss how they conceptualize young people and children, how they think about the digital technologies and the risks and opportunities that arise, and to give us a sense of the research projects that they are leading. And we also have with us today the Europe, European Commission lead, who is responsible for these projects to help us understand how these, the research findings and conceptions can contribute to knowledge and to the development of European policies. So I'm going to introduce our three, our four speakers in turn from the four different projects uh, and invite them to give us five minutes on how their research um, uh, uh, has been framed. Uh, I will ask each of them a follow-up question and before moving on to the next and I'll introduce each as we come to them and we'll then hear from um, June Larry Kingston um, from the European Commission and in the meantime I invite everyone to pose questions in the Q&A function on Zoom and Maria Stoilova is as our discussant is going to uh, Keep an eye on the questions coming through uh, and we will have plenty of time, I hope, for discussion to put these to the speakers um, later. And I think you're all getting um, instructions on how to give those, uh, how to raise your questions um, uh, in the chat. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our first of the four speakers and first of the projects um, in the, um, uh, which is uh, Hatla Bjorg 
Holmans Dottir, who is a professor at the Oslo Metropolitan University and project coordinator of the um, project DigiGen. DigiGen, as she will explain, investigates digital media use in educational institutions, the home as leisure activities, and to think about um, children and young people's digital citizenship. And Hutler's own, work, Hutler's own work focuses on comparative educational policies and practices, particularly in relation to marginalization and social justice. And drawing on interdisciplinary approaches, she has conducted research on language issues, gender, education, youth research in countries as diverse as Namibia, South Africa, Sudan, Tanzania, and most recently, Europe. So Hutler, the floor is yours if you would kindly Shared screen, thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. And uh, thank you to, to LSE and of course to CORE for co-hosting this event. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my fantastic team at DigiGen, who I'm so lucky to work with. Um, and in particular, our consortium member uh, from COFASI and Nenki, who works there, and our graphic designer, Jesus, who have helped me out with some of the graphics for today's presentation. Um, I would like to start out, of course, be, since this is part of CORE's theories work package, I'll begin to look at DigiGen's sort of theoretical frame. And in what's important is our sort of concepts and approach. Our theoretical framework looks at sort of ecological systems and techno subsystems theory, which in, in other words, ecosystems surrounding children and young people. For us, it's important to look at the environmental influences situating young people, uh, young children and young people uh, within a system of relationships and with multiple levels of interactions. What's also important for us is a transitions uh, sort of thinking, a life course perspective. This is particularly important because our sample ranges from ages five to 18. And uh, keep this in mind as I run through the slides. For us, it's important to consider the continuity and discontinuity in life pathways, which for uh, DigiGen means it could link to risk, but also resilience and enha enhancing factors. What's important is the role of individuals in their own development uh, and the importance of historical change. And for us, it's not just historical change in general, but it can be historical change in terms of how parents look to their own childhood in raising their children. Our framework is then conceptualized into this sort of infographic, looking at how the ecosystem influences on the digital generation. So in other words, the relationships and interactions with and between a child or young person's family, education institutions, leisure time, civic participation, and how these influence children's development. What's important to look at in this infographic is these different ecosystems, but also the way in which technology crosses across all these different systems, but also the aspect of time. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the link between our theory and our methodological approach. So it's important to consider a lot of the research on children and technology has mainly been survey based and few studies, uh, most of the studies have been quantitative. And however, few studies have looked at pre-adolescent children, that is children under the age of 12. And that's why it was very important for us to look at the youngest children. Um, we fill this gap, of course, by using a participatory approach, collecting qualitative data, but also including children and young people as co-researchers. Uh, it's important for us to understand children and young people as social actors in their own development, and they're seen as beings uh, who are considered as active agents, in a sense. They're social actors who are competent, capable of co-constructing their lives, but also able to comment on things that affect them. What's also important for our sort of conceptual framework is the idea of children are understand as being versus just becoming. So recognizing that children are not static beings, but they have a past and they have a future. And the integration of these two images of the child as both being and becoming, they are afforded more agency. We also see the fact that children are co-constructors of childhood, but also of society. And there's a need for a kind of third temporal stance, which demonstrates how children are oriented both in the present, but also in the future. 
And then finally, I'd like to close off by giving a kind of overall presentation of our project. Our main question, how are children and young people affected by the technological transformations in their everyday lives? And it's really the everyday lives that's important for us at DigiGen. We really want to get in and understand how people, uh, young people's lives are. Uh, these are our different research questions related to the various work packages and then the methods um, that we use in each of the work packages. At the bottom, there is work package eight, which is electronic media. Uh, news sources, newsletters, and so on. Even though that's not, uh, that's basically an output, but we felt it was important to connect to give an overall picture. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hatla. That was um, a very inspiring way to start. And I really love the um, emphasis on children's um, own perspectives on, on their world and their world in the round. Uh, and also the fact that you're going to be co-constructing the research in some really crucial ways um, with them. So I feel that I got a really good sense of, of how you, um, in, in DigiGen, how you conceptualize children and young people. I wonder if you could say a little about how you're thinking about the digital world or the technological transformations, because children don't necessarily know everything that sits behind, as it were, the device that they use or the, or the interfaces that they engage with. So how, how will, you, will you be led by the children in defining the technological or how, how is that another ecosystem to, to contend with? Well, I think I, we see the technology going across all the different ecosystems and we, uh, for us, it, I think it will be important to see how in the way in which children, the things that they find important and to sort of discuss this technology with them, uh, what, how this technology affects the different systems. Of course, we're going to be talking very much to children and young people, but also their families also mm -hmm. their teachers. So I think in getting a more broader picture, I really wanted to focus on the children and young people because I think this is what we're doing a little bit differently, but certainly trying to get the, the more holistic picture from the different mm -hmm. actors. And so hopefully that idea of their understanding of what lies behind the technology will maybe come out both from their end, but also in the way in which parents and children uh, look at technology and some of the challenges it brings in their everyday lives. Brilliant, thank you. Um, it feels that there is there is so much more to say and I'm hoping that people are uh, already beginning to pose um, some questions to the speakers when we get to that um, point in the afternoon. Um, but I will now turn to our next um, project and I would like to introduce Lane Dynans who is um, full professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences and project coordinator of Youth Skills, also known as Y Skills. And why skills investigates the new skill sets needed to benefit from ever more digitized environments and it aims to enhance and maximize the long term positive impact of the digital environment for young people. Lane is an expert in European media policy and its impact on citizens and has particular expertise on the performance of public and private service media outlets as well as social media platforms and their impact on children and adolescents. And she has a particular focus on vulnerable young people with a migration background, which I know will also find its way into the, the Y Skills project, as I'm sure she will now explain. So Lane, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for this uh, great uh, introduction of the project already. So um, here on the second slide, you can see the Y skills environment, uh, so to speak, the dashboard, which makes visible in a succinct way what we promised uh, the European Commission to do this year and the next three years. So we started from the observation that compared to, say, a decade ago, ICT use has become far more omnipresent, but that there is still a great variability in the ICT behaviors of Europe's young people. This means that for too many of them, there is still a serious digital skills deficit. And in order to understand why and how some benefit from ICT use, while others seem to be impacted negatively, more research on the role of digital skills is crucial. And therefore, the aim, the overarching aim of Y skills is to enhance and to maximize long term positive impact of the ICT environment on multiple aspects of well being for all young people through the enhancement of digital skills. 
So we found that most existing research is focused on a single well-being dimension and also first and foremost on negative effects, neglecting the positive outcomes. Comprehensive approaches are lacking as researchers often either adopt a developmental focus or a sociocultural one. And Y skills will do both. In Y skills, the notion of well-being includes cognitive, physical, psychological, and social dimensions of well-being. When we look at the model, we'll see that Y skills proposes that digital skills mediate between individual variables, which include already pre-existing inequalities, and ICT use variables on the one hand, and well-being on the other hand. Y skills proposes a holistic, child-centric approach where young people are considered to have active agency, indicating that they're not passive recipients and they select their content and their device. So looking at the model a bit further, we'll, you'll see that we built on the 2018 EU Kids Conceptual Model by adding to it certain things, like a longitudinal approach, by adding to it performance testing of digital skills, by adding explanatory and foresight modeling, and by adding also a personal network data view of the child. And in that way, we aim to contribute to our knowledge of long-term effects. The Y skills conceptual model will be tested through longitudinal survey data in six countries that are positioned differently on the DAISY, the Digital Economy and Society Index. So ultimately, this will lead to further iterative model improvement on the antecedents and the consequences of digital skills, on the relationships between risks and opportunity, so as to arrive at a better understanding of uh, inequalities in ICT use and well-being in late youth and early adulthood, and also come up with a remedial action. We will consider ICT use also as embedded in contexts, ranging from direct interactions in social groups and classrooms, but also in public libraries and in families, to uh, interpersonal exchanges via ICT. And currently, there is no authoritative account of either the antecedents or the consequences of digital skills, despite the huge amounts of policy documents and efforts in education that assume the importance of digital skills. And the LSC team within uh, Y skills already identified the present knowledge and the existing gaps about skills acquisition through a systematic evidence mapping. And uh, our Milan team uh, echoed, in a way, the report uh, they will make will echo uh, the actions or the actors and factors uh, uh, report uh, by the LSC team in the sense that they ran a secondary analysis of the 2020 EU kids data. The reports are not released yet. They're still under peer review, but they will be released at the beginning of November. So without preempting, of course, the findings, I would like to mention uh, that the reviewed well-being studies identified more gaps than answers. That won't surprise you uh, uh, when it came to uh, the notions of well-being because they adopted too narrow measurements of, of well-being or because they responded often in not a specific enough measurement uh, of, uh, di of digital skills. So we hope that Y skills will do both. When we look now at uh, the digital skills testing, I think there is a, a fresh approach needed. Uh, there is an underdevelopment of measures for especially the testing of the softer, non-technical, non-operational skills that allow young people to safely interact in a civil manner on social media. So one such area is that of critical information literacy. And this information literacy has never been as important as in today's world, affected by COVID-19 and the infodemic that comes with it. At least that was one of the conclusions of the EU culture ministers when they came together last May. And importantly enough, we heard a similar message during the first report delivered by Wiseskills based on the interviews with 34 experts in education and on the labor market. So, and here on the slide, you can see a few important uh, takeaways. The report is out, but we will start the press releases as of Monday. So clearly, the successful development of digital skills is a task that requires the involvement of all, including citizens themselves, young and old, but also the public and the private sector. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lane. Um, and as Lane implied, um, at LSE, we've been working um, with um, Lane and colleagues uh, on the Y Skills um, project and uh, doing that um, uh, systematic mapping and uh, evidence review. Um, so certainly, Lane, that um, gave me, uh, I spent the last few months really thinking very hard about this concept of skills because many um, in the kind of European debate have talked for a long time about media literacy and digital literacy and indeed we had um, a whole webinar recently on you know whether there are significant differences among all of these terms. So I wonder if you could just say something um, about um, why, why it's especially a skills framework that you, that you draw upon and does that have resonance with um, other kinds of skills in children's lives. I don't know, from the skill of riding a bike to perhaps more um, interestingly, the skill of learning to read and write. So how does a skills framework kind of fit? And um, as a rider to that in a way, um, uh, are digital skills going to change so fast because the technology is always changing that the research will be out of date before you're done? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, we have to keep up uh, the pace, but the pace is very, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a tough job because it's a, it's a moving uh, target. But you mm -hmm. know, I think there's a lot of room for Y skills because as you've uh, seen it yourself, uh, the, mm -hmm. the team, uh, you've been looking at hundreds uh, of uh, articles and in fact only six articles were really looking at skills and the link between antecedents and, and, and consequences. Only six mm -hmm. articles. And mm -hmm. then, uh, not even in Europe, it was in, uh, mm. in, in Australia and, other, and, and the US and then some in Europe and they were not uh, longitudinal, they were not multi-country uh, mm. uh, articles. So I think there's a lot uh, to be said about the skills as a mediator mm -hmm. and then we saw also that there's very few uh, research out on the consequences of digital skills, especially mm. the link with, as you were mentioning, the offline uh, mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think um, bringing all that together, the online and the offline world, needing to slice it uh, some way to you know to sell what we have come up with but also bring it together will be the main uh, challenge because we have to uh, bring together um, empirical uh, different research and methods and also different uh, theories but i think we have not found uh, a lot of research uh, first of all mm. the mm. few uh, articles we're dealing with exactly what we uh, aim uh, to target and when they were doing it was in either a too narrow or not a uh, specific uh, enough uh, way mm. so i think also when you look at policy documents employability and skills and well digital skills are very important because 95 percent mm -hmm. of the jobs uh, mm -hmm. need uh, digital uh, ability well a certain degree of digital ability so we'll have to make sure that we look at specific skills that we mm -hmm. slice these skills, that we put them in combination with other outcomes, tangible outcomes, like learning outcomes, for instance, and that we also look at the interactions with other very important social demographic and, and other antecedents mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of children, like uh, SES yeah. uh, or access, uh, etc. Yeah. So I think we have a lot to do, but it's uh, <laughs> we very do. well chosen without even knowing at the moment of uh, proposal writing that there would be so little out there. Right, right, brilliant. Thank you. So I will turn to our third um, research project. Um, Marco Huber is an associate professor at um, Aarhus University and project coordinator of Digimatex, if that's how you say it. Uh, Digimatex focuses on the development of a, quote, digital youth maturity index, an evidence-based tool to assist in understanding and determining children's digital maturity. Marco's work offers insights into the Internet of Things, smart device adoption and use, the antecedents of consumer behavior and individual based innovation. So I look forward to hearing about the project and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And also, I think I really liked the, the talks already. So I think um, that our project is, is actually complementing the other projects quite nicely, hopefully, and you kind of see that as well. And I also uh, here as, a, as only the communicator of our overall project and, and uh, I'm speaking in, in front of, uh, of all the, for all the people working on that project already and they did already a, quite a tremendous work here. And um, so I want to also try to in five minutes or a little bit more uh, try to um, 
summarize what we actually do in this project, what, where we are coming from and what, what we are actually interested in, in, in achieving. And as a, as a starting point, of course, uh, uh, the overall idea is here also um, like, uh, like the DigiGen project. So we are more or less interested in, in children's everyday life activities. So we are not, we are, have something in our project, but we are uh, looking for, for things that happens outside structured environment like, like educational settings. Yeah, so, and also we have, we, our target group is more or less nine to, nine to 18 um, years old children. And when, when, when you when you go further and explaining what we are doing, so we have actually at a starting point, uh, two major components of two major aspects we, we are interested in. And the first one is actually that we, we, we kind of separate or make a disjunction between uh, essential and non-essential ICT related activities, because it's, it's quite interesting for, for our research. So we see essential ICT related activities, essential parts of it, as that we use them our mobile or we use applications in order to solve a task or to achieve a specific goal. Uh, but then there are also non-essential parts of it. So where we maybe don't know, don't actually need a mobile or don't need the application, but we kind of getting distracted by our notification of our messenger services. So this is kind of hindering us on kind of achieving a goal or, or reaching uh, performing on a specific task. So we are interested in these, these uh, distribution of these essential and non-essential tasks. And here, um, as a second part, of course, uh, like all the other projects as well, so we acknowledge the tremendous uh, information which is already out there on all the antecedents, all the important factors uh, influencing children in, in their use of ICTs and their use of mobile devices, for example, and how it actually uh, uh, it's benefiting, but also harming their, their, their well-being or their kind of behavioral stuff. So this, it's the same, we are kind of collecting these data as well. But on the other hand, uh, our project is, is kind of focusing and then we do a lot of neuroscience stuff and psychological behavioral research is actually uh, interested in all these underlying, say, often automatic processes. Yeah, and we think that these, these non-observable implicit processes actually are interacting uh, to a high degree with these factors uh, described there above. And, uh, and we want to try to figure out hidden patterns by collecting all this information, by all this data, kind of in order to, to develop some kind of prediction models uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for behavioral aspects of, of children's um, activities, ICT related activities. So this, is, so this is the starting point where we are coming from. And then uh, it's in the name and you, you, I think you spelled it right. So it's kind of, so we, we are interested in, we are conceptualized, so we're interested in, in developing kind of a digital maturity index or a digital youth maturity index. So we are coming from a conceptualization of so-called digital maturity. And we see that this has two components in right now. So we it's kind of a working definition. So, and we see that children's digital maturity itself, we see it as a dynamic concept. So it, it develops, but also changes over time. So it's, but it's not like a skill or a competence which kind of increases by, by experience or by use or whatever. It's, it's, we see it not as, often not as a not linear process, we see it as, as non-linear effects maybe happening that you kind of increase in something and that maybe also maturity can decrease because you change from kindergarten to the first class, you change uh, to, to, uh, um, to kind of high school and maybe there's something happening that it's, it's kind of having some bumps or whatever. So that's, that's the idea of it. And the second, uh, so it's a dynamic concept. Yeah? And the second part of it is that we say that we, we actually added a, a behavioral component, a goal-directed component in, in our conceptualization. So we say it's not about that we learn something, we, we actually gain a skill or competence. We actually need to know how we use and especially assess and regulate our behavior on when, how, and we should use these uh, different devices and possible technological possibilities in order to make it beneficial for or harmful for our uh, daily behavior. And by saying assessing and, and um, ability, it's, it could be a skill, it could be competence related, but it's actually also related to the ideas, the ethical idea of subjective valuation and devaluation. That's the kind of a concept that we, we actually give values to specific activities and uh, we chose these values which give us a higher reward, for example, right? So and this could be something that that children's uh, value non-essential activities, subjective value non-essential activities higher than the focal task they maybe have to do. And we want to figure out if this is the point. And then if maybe self-regulation capacities kind of stepping in and helping maybe to increase the value of the focal task, so what they actually have to do, but 
also maybe also on the other hand to kind of devalue the 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 uh, devalue the, the non-essential activity and yeah, that they kind of devalue the, the urge to uh, to grab your phone and check your messenger while you're doing something else that's just in just really a simple example and this finally spills over in our in our over project idea that we on the one hand uh, com uh, uh, collect a lot of information and re doing research on specific ICT related behavior and this fills into our data pool and this fills into our index idea the dimensional aspect of our index idea but we are also interested in in comparing and checking that if for example someone has issues in in, in, uh, in kind of devaluing their non-essential tasks they always are urged to check their messages by doing things if those people if those children also have issues in domain unspecific aspects like food consumption like doing uh, intertemporal choices they're only more short-term reward interested and long-term reward interested so it is have kind of a specific spill over in these areas as well and at the end hopefully we will come up with a uh, with an index which is also based on uh, all these fancy things on machine learning prediction modeling uh, uh, what is out there and methods for kind of figuring out and predicting specific behavioral aspects. And based on these parts, then at the end, of course, like the others also are doing, is having co-creation um, workshops, doing some, some integration of, of the stakeholders, especially children, in order to figure out what could be recommendations, what could be solutions to, to support them in their beneficial uh, usage, but also to, to help them when, when, it's, when it's harmful for them. So that, that is it in a nutshell. <laughs> Um, I don't think I could quite describe it as a nutshell because there was an awful lot yeah. there for, um, <laughs> yeah. for all of us to um, think about. But uh, that was that was really fascinating, Marco. I mean, I think listening to you speak, I, I felt like there is a um, perhaps tacitly or maybe explicitly an account of the digital world, uh, digital mm. environment. Um, so you're, if you if we imagine children um, unable to stop checking their messages, it's because somebody has designed a flow of messages in a way that will be very mm -hmm. appealing to them. And if children are struggling with self-regulation, then that's because perhaps the digital world is designed in a way mm -hmm. that um, kind of overcomes their um, their perhaps their uh, developing capacities to regulate. Mm. So I just wonder how you how you how you think about this digital world for which children need digital maturity, and and is yeah. that part of the project or is it a bit on the side? Yeah, what, what I think you tackle some important issues here as maybe we all deal with. So one thing is actually a quite correlational assumption, right? So you don't really know, is it me influencing my use behavior or, or is the technology mm -hmm. influencing mm -hmm. how I use it? Mm -hmm. So it's actually so, therefore, of course, we do some kind of intervention things in order to kind of get some, some causality in what is actually happening here. Is the, the design of a technology, the sound notification, it is actually so help, uh, kind of uh, influencing me and in, in doing more non-essential activities and, and leaving the focus of the focus touch. That's actually that's actually one thing. And this is this, the thing we, we are we are interested in. It's not on one hand, let's say from from our from my perspective during neuroscience studies. So it's a kind of a brain development issue. So it's 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 usually checking when when people have different learning uh, um, um, skills or have if issues to learn or to memorize or to perform. This actually so or regulate themselves in other contexts. It actually might also have an influence because if you if you're really impulsive this actually helps this has also an impact on how you use ICTs right but also we also interested kind of this this uh, how you value things what the valuation is in it, the subjective valuation idea but of course the other thing is also really interested and this is why we are integrating and like the others probably also integrating children and the stakeholders into the recommendation solution system because we say so we say that you cannot uh, uh, you cannot uh, stop them for using technology. So you need technological solutions helping them stop using technology. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is kind of uh, really interesting and it's really fascinating. And, and I agree with you that one thing has come from technology. So we have to investigate what it actually leads to urges, leads to impulsive behavior and what is actually then on the, in the personality itself. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to look forward to your results and I think a number of um, digital designers will uh, too. Um, so I'm going to come to our, our fourth um, speaker. 
Um, this is um, uh, Uwe Hasselbrink, uh, who is the director of the Leibniz Institute for Media Research at the Hans Bredow Institute um, at the University of Hamburg, where he's also a professor in empirical communication research. And he's the project coordinator of CORE, Children Online Research and Evidence. So that this project is a little bit different. Um, it aims to create a European knowledge platform on digital technologies in the lives of children and young people. Um, and Uwe um, comes to this work also as coordinator of the European research network EU Kids Online um, and a member of the steering group for Global Kids Online and his own research um, really draws on um, questions of media uses and effects in digital environments with a particular focus on intercultural comparisons. So uh, Uwe, um, tell us what a coordination and support action is and uh, how it um, supports. Yeah, thank you very much, Sonia, uh, for this opportunity to describe our project. As you have said, we are different uh, from the other projects. If we just have a look at the ensemble of projects that is currently under uh, preparation here, um, CORE is different because it is a coordination and support action. Uh, and the aim is to create a comprehensive pan-European knowledge platform with the participation of international researchers, educators, policy makers, and concerned dialogue groups. In this graph, you see the three other projects. And in addition, you see the logo of EU Kids Online Net, uh, because um, at least two of these two projects, Y Skills and particularly CORE, heavily rely on the cooperation of our great network in more than 30 European countries. I would like to give you an expression how the project structure looks like uh, when it comes to, uh, in order to illustrate our approach and our understanding of what um, a knowledge base could look like. Um, at the very core of core, uh, we have the empirical evidence. It is key aim to collect empirical evidence from different European countries. That is one of the core issues here to collect evidence from different language areas, not only the English language areas, but all the many uh, European languages to collect empirical evidence. So one part is to have an evidence base that is searchable um, to the public at the same time to have a kind of data archive to help researchers to make use of existing data set as far as they are available. However, um, this is obviously not enough to collect and to provide empirical evidence. Uh, it has been, has to be brought to life. And therefore the key, the bigger number of work packages is related to engaging with the research community. So to mediate between this kind of collected empirical evidence and the people who are actually doing research. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we are dealing with key topics, with short briefings on particular relevant topics. We are dealing right in this moment, because uh, this webinar is a part of the Work Package 5 theory session led by the LSE and Sonia Livingstone and Maria Stoilova. Uh, we are dealing with which kind of conceptual, conceptual approaches and theories can be observed in European research in these areas. We will deal with methods, what are the methods that underlie, and we will deal with ethical issues. In addition to that, we are also dealing with other stakeholders, and uh, this is um, clear last but not least, we are aware uh, that a knowledge platform uh, means nothing um, if the stakeholders, if those who have to apply, who have to have to apply knowledge, who have to learn from knowledge, um, are not involved. And therefore, we have two work packages dealing with stakeholders from policy and industry um, and education. So far, this very short sketch. Since in this webinar we are talking about theory, what is the relationship to theory. In a way, we are just descriptive collectors of evidence, 
but obviously we run immediately run into a big challenge. International evidence on children and online media is extensive, heterogeneous, and partly contradictory. One conviction that we start from is that theory and the question that this work package five deals with um, can help to structure and condense this evidence, the extensive evidence, but it can help to integrate uh, the heterogeneous evidence that we are confronted with and that it is able to contextualize evidence in order to avoid uh, context-free applications of some pieces of evidence that might be misleading when applied to the practice. This brings me to another level of theory that we are confronted with. In a way, this project is very much about science communication and many expectations with regard to our project go to the direction as if science communication and as part of science communication, this kind of platform could be a one directional transfer of decontextualized pieces of knowledge from academia to society. That is not our approach. In our understanding, science communication is, as the name says, is a communication process in which different kinds of actors negotiate the relevance of topics. That is what we see. We see that in different countries, at different points of time, different topics seem to be more relevant or less relevant. Uh, they have to negotiate the prevalence of concepts and theories. Some theories in some times in some countries seem to be taken for granted as quasi simple um, descriptions of reality and not um, put into question. Uh, other theories really have to struggle to be um, regarded as serious approaches. And finally, uh, they also have to negotiate the claim of validity of research findings. As most of us, and I'm sure I share the view of most of the listeners in this respect, is uh, have to make the um, experience that findings differ in the degree to which they are, they tend to be accepted by politicians or even by the other research colleagues. So that is this kind of our understanding of uh, the process of science communication is a kind of negotiation process in which we would like to engage ourselves. Therefore, the core team sets out to better understand why some topics in our field get more or less attention and why certain theories are more or less prevalent in specific social contexts. And therefore, we are looking forward to future cooperation with as many as possible from your side. Thank you. Uva, thank you very much indeed. Um, there's a lot um, that the core platform is going to have to uh, contend with, I think, in um, uh, bringing together uh, all these different dialogues. And I wonder, I mean, in a way, um, you've set out two that I think, or we've heard two that I think are particularly um, challenging. One is the uh, cross-national dialogue, how um, theories and findings might be different in different parts of Europe, and perhaps how Europe might be um, uh, different uh, from other parts of the world. Of course it is. Um, and the other, um, perhaps more tacit in what you've said, is the different disciplines that we're bringing together, because I think we've heard here of everything from the input of neuroscience through to the kind of socio-cultural theory, developmental psychology, education, um, media studies. Um, I don't know if you want to say something about where you see the kind of the, the, the what are the core challenges to, to, to coin a pun, which, which do you think is going to be the most challenging and perhaps also the most productive in bringing together these different voices and experiences? You're completely right. This is uh, one of the challenges we are um, really looking forward to, uh, to solve it. Um, at first hand, the first task is to bring things together. 
in order to be as comprehensive as possible. Um, the second one is to demonstrate where there are links, where there are similarities, where there is overlap, and where we find contradictions in order to make them as transparent as possible. Uh, because one implicit understanding when we are asked to practice science communication or to have evidence-based policies is hard, hand on our hearts, our evidence is not consistent um, all the time. So we actually have to deal with these contradictions. Uh, we have to make them explicit and to try to understand where they come from. Is it just an issue of deciding for a certain methodological approach? Um, is it really a value-based decision? For example, if you take, we take children as agents um, of their socialization versus no, they are objects of socialization process. So these tiny differences that we can observe in many of these things um, and putting things at the same side nearby each other might help to inspire a discourse that helps to overcome the fruitless um, contradictions or debates on uh, now I'm on the right side or you are on the right side. Uh, this doesn't help as we can perfectly or um, yes, as we can perfectly observe in the current times with regard to getting a common understanding of what is going on in the corona pandemic, um, for example. But it, is, but it is similar. We all know about the discussions about um, the role of media literacy and how it is regarded and the role of risk and harm. Uh, and that is actually one of uh, the issues we try to, as I said, to be as comprehensive as possible at the beginning, mm -hmm. in order not to exclude mm -hmm. a particular perspective and to show and to help to bring those perspectives into contact. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. It's going to be a, um, an exciting um, few years ahead. Um, so I'm going to um, turn to our last uh, speaker now, but um, I just want to say to everyone who's um, patiently listening, we are next going to uh, come to your questions. And I can see that questions are um, flowing in. So do please um, ask your question if you, um, if you have one, uh, and um, we're going to uh, get through as many as we can. But first, um, uh, I'm very pleased that we have with us June Lowry Kingston, who is head of un a unit called Accessibility, Multilingualism and Safer Internet at the European Commission uh, at the Directorate General for Communications Networks, Content and Technology. Um, and her work aims to promote a better internet for children, protecting and empowering children online and improving the quality of content available to them. Her unit is also responsible for making the uh, digital single market more accessible, secure and inclusive and for monitoring the implementation of the Web Accessibility Directive. So um, June, I think you are the architect of uh, all that we've heard so far, um, uh, perhaps uh, not entirely um, because the European Commission processes are always complex, but uh, I would love to hear from you um, uh, how you see this coming together and why it is that um, you see this as a value for um, uh, EC policy and practice. Okay. Thanks, Sonia. And I have crossed my fingers that my hotel room connection will <laughs> last me for the next five minutes. Fingers crossed. Here we go. So um, to start off in general, children's well-being online and offline has been one of the European Commission's priorities since the year dot, since the very beginnings of mm. the Internet. And those policies have evolved from protection to user empowerment and now much more to actively involving young people, as we've heard already, as children's access to and use of the digital world has evolved. And this journey started, as some of you remember, with the Safer Internet programmes, which gave birth, for example, to the highly respected EU Kids Online initiative and the 2020 Better Internet for Kids strategy. And I'm glad to say that more funding is planned in the next seven year financial framework under the Digital Europe and the Horizon Europe programmes. Now, diversity and discrimination and this includes children's well-being online, 
I'm very glad to say you're getting more political attention under this current commission. An EU strategy for a more effective fight against child sexual abuse was just adopted in July. July mm -hmm. And the president explicitly invited uh, one of the commissioners on the upcoming strategy on the rights of the child to address children's rights online, among other topics. The public consultation on that rights of the child strategy is now open. It's open until the 8th of December, so you have plenty of time, but I warmly invite you to share your expertise and experience and to contribute to that consultation, please. Mm -hmm. Now, our work, as I'm sure many future research options and future PhDs um, are possible be, and took on a whole dimension with the COVID pandemic. We had families rapidly adapting to relying exclusively on the digital world for education and employment, as well as the usual entertainment, information and social contact options. And I'm sure we've all said at some stage over the last few months, how on earth did we cope? Would we have coped before the internet? And this this unprecedented and enforced switch in behaviour has shown us all really firsthand, I think, more than any political declaration could ever do, the benefits of the digital transformation, but it's also left children potentially more exposed to online risks, those immediate risks, but also perhaps to form new habits that could exceed their digital maturity that we were just hearing about, and potentially in the long term bring further harm. For our children to grow up as both competent and confident digital citizens, we need an online environment that really reflects our European values, the values that we as both parents and teachers and those that social, working with children would want to instill in our children as they grow up. And to create such an environment, the Commission cannot act alone. We need relevant and so, for relevant and solid evidence-based policies, we obviously need solid and relevant evidence on which to base them. We need that in-depth understanding that Ube was talking about of the diverse opportunities and risks that children across Europe meet online, while understanding that children are not a homogenous body. As, as we heard from my skills, divided by language, by country, by family type, socioeconomic group, and so on and so on. And only you and the research community can provide us with such relevant data and analysis to help us understand what the data means. So as policymakers, we rely on and we really want to work with academics and researchers to identify both the known unknowns but also to have you help us identify the unknown unknowns. What should we be looking at that's not even on our radar? What don't we know that we should be taking into consideration? Now, of course, there is some research, valuable research going on at national level on the child online experience. And I pay tribute also to those of you who kept the EU Kids Online initiative going after the EU funding research ended. And that I think is a testimony both to the value of the original project and to its sound basis that it could keep going. There are examples of interesting but obviously smaller projects at national level available in the research section of the betterinternetforkids.eu platform. And if you don't yet know it, it's the pan-European hub for resources and practice for child online safety gathered from our network, European-wide network of safer internet centers. And examples there include recent studies on uh, online, get, online habits of children in Greece, on pato streaming in Poland, and a Dutch study on financial sextortion in young boys and, and adolescents. And that's just to name a few that you can find there. So our safer internet centers across Europe alert us also to emerging risks really quickly through the helpline service they provide. But European-wide longitudinal research studies are of particular importance from our perspective because understanding the long-term effects of behavior in the digital environment and its impact is every bit as important as reacting promptly to emerging risks. And final point, I really welcome the approach mentioned already today by DigiGen and DigiMatix of treating children as co-researchers. And we'd invite all researchers working on this topic to present, um, to consider 
research working with young people online? How can we further develop research methodologies to involve young people in a more active and participatory, participatory role in such research? Because they have this unique and unparalleled insight into the social experiment that really we're all living. So to sum up, we in the European Commission are very excited about this complementary group of H2020 projects and also by your mutual cooperation from the get-go. The three research projects, DigiGen Skills, DigiMatex, will greatly improve our understanding of the online behaviour of children and young people. And through CORE, we are really excited about this platform to pool uh, existing knowledge, to fill, identify and fill the research gaps and to build capacity as a really useful resource for you as well as for us. So these four projects together, I'm sure, are going to make a great contribution to a safer and more beneficial use of digital technologies. It will help you formulate insightful and evidence-based recommendations, and that in turn can lead to better regulation at both national and European level. And I wish all concerned great success, and I really thank you for the role you're playing in making a better internet for children. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's very um, inspiring and very heartening. And, um, you know, there's a lot of um, somewhat cynical things said, both about whether evidence is really kind of welcome in policy making circles and also about whether um, some of the complexities of evidence are really welcome. Because I think what we've heard from the projects is a commitment to take into account uh, the many factors that we know really do shape children's lives. And we're all kind of struggling to, uh, to, to, to keep a complex picture and a holistic vision of the of the child's life so um so i think i heard some reassurance there uh, i don't know if you have uh, advice for the research community um a sense of how it is that it's most helpful for us to bring the evidence to policymakers at a useful point um we're sometimes told we're always too late i uh, hope that's not the case um. yes of course sooner is better and, um, but, and I'm sure, you know, events like today are very, very helpful as well, you know, this communication. Um, mm. Never underestimate our ignorance. Don't assume <laughs> that we understand things because uh, that, uh, as you say, it's complicated and you really are the experts in your field. So you have to explain to us in words that we can understand. This is at least speaking for myself, not for myself. <laughs> uh, <Of course> not. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't speak for them with my level of ignorance. And, but I would, be, I would also invite you to challenge us because if I dare mention the B word for it briefly, um, there was a great poster during the Brexit referendum, which was distrust simple questions simple answers to complex questions. Mm -hmm. And from what we've heard today, you know, we've had a tiny, tiny snippet, an overview of what you're all aiming with these four different projects. Mm -hmm. And of course it's complex, it's mm -hmm. not easy. And sometimes mm -hmm. when it comes to um, drafting legislation, let alone the process of then negotiating legislation, things do get reduced to the common denominator. But mm -hmm. that shouldn't mean to say that we should be as well informed as we possibly could be from the start. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are things that are going to move in terms of uh, the online environment, I think, under this commission. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's very easy to be cynical about policymakers and the commission, but I think um, you can see through the mission statements that the president wrote, probably getting on a year ago now, yeah. that uh, she is very committed to these sort of soft topics, the more social topics. Um, she's also got lots of experience in this field of also digital world, mm -hmm. and she's a mother of seven. So I think um, she is also bringing her own personal values and her own uh, mm -hmm. sort of view of things. And I think that's quite a change. So mm -hmm. I'm personally also really quite inspired by this new commission. So mm -hmm. let's hope and let's stay optimistic, despite <laughs> all the challenges of the current times. I, I, I'm delighted to be so. Um, so thank you very much, June. Um, so we do have lots of questions and we have um, 15 minutes left on the clock. I am told that we are going to come to a hard stop um, in 15 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to turn the floor now to Maria Stoliver, um, who has been monitoring all your questions and I think is going to do a brilliant um, uh, dissection and synthesis to put them uh, to um, any of our speakers who would like to um, respond. So Maria, can I invite you to yes 
Thank you, Sonia. And thank you very much to everyone who has been posting questions. Uh, so many interesting areas to cover. So I'm going to directly go into um, combining a couple of questions which are about the social environment. Uh, so surely, uh, Jilu says that they find that many times children interaction with technology is taken out of the context of changing uh, life generally in the era. Uh, so how are we going to engage and make sure that this social context is represented and others in children's life, like parents and teachers, uh, role models are feeding into our understanding of children's uh, engagement with digital technology. And to add on to this, Amaranta Alfro also asked about the country uh, and cultural differences. So I think that kind of can be added to the, the question about how do we engage uh, the question about the social environment. I think all, all the, the projects can probably um, express their views on um, how they think this could be done. I could answer that uh, briefly. Um, I think, and I, I looked at some of the questions a little bit, and I think one thing that we are trying to do, I mean, for us to get into children's everyday lives is, is not easy. We actually would love to get into their phones and their computers, but obviously GDPR does not allow us to do that. Um, but we have developed an app, which we're hoping that the, the families at least and the children will be using um, to take snapshots, uh, sort of everyday kind of things that they are doing, things that are important to them, things that give them meaning. Um, so they will be able to it's upload it to a secure server automatically. It's not kept on the phone. So we've we've taken care of all the GDPR regulations. It's not a it's not a fantastically what you could say sexy app in a sense, uh, um, but it does the job and it's it's basically a research tool. And for us, that's the way to get children and young people as co-researchers with us. We want them to tell us what's important. And in that way, they can also discuss and describe the context in which these pictures that they're taking, uh, what does it mean to them? What is it, uh, what are they doing? Um, is this something that scares them? Is this something that they find enjoyable? So that in that way, we can get a sense of, of what they're doing every day. So hopefully that will allow us some of the context and the same we're going to do with, with families as well. Great. Maybe I could add also that from Wiseskill's perspective, we also will uh, be uh, looking at the, the contexts uh, that are not only the classroom. So I, I stressed a bit the classroom and the survey, but we will uh, uh, get in touch with them, for instance, in the library when it comes to disenfranchised, disadvantaged families uh, and, and, and children. And that there will be uh, also communication with the children at every stage of the research in the different countries, thanks to uh, the collaboration with uh, European Schoolnet. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maybe I also add just a short one to it. So, because of course we also do these these environmental issues and the kind of infra and integrating parents in, in the research and the perception of it. But I think also because it's interesting and, and June mentioned it. So the long term Im effect of it, the long term impact of it. So I think it's also what we what we need to acknowledge and what we need to consider is that that. The, the perception of long-term effects of their behavior differs between parents, teachers, and children, right? So what mm. children think what their long-term effect is, it completely might be completely different from, from parents. So this actually makes it much more complex to figure out what are the important antecedents and so forth. And that's actually, we also try to, to tackle in, in this kind of research and also together with the other projects. Mm. What good question. Yes. Um, and also, I think your answers also tap onto the, the diversity of, of this social environment and uh, the many questions that we have about uh, what antecedents, what consequences are important and how they, uh, they play together. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how these projects can be integrated to, to give us a better knowledge, uh, especially having in mind the diversity in methodology used uh, to assess that. Uh, but to, to move on to another couple of questions, um, Mengding Wang and Josie Cochrane asked them in, in different ways, but they tap on to an area that I'm personally fascinated to think about, which is about regulation and responsibility. Um, so EU policies concerning children in the internet, um, they, they focus uh, on their regulation, uh, on the importance of individuals uh, to, to be responsible for their own behavior. Uh, so uh, the, the questions are around uh, how do we see the future uh, developing and where the, the regulation, the responsibility should lay, should they be more uh, in terms of uh, children, uh, seeing them more as active agents, 
or uh, do we want to, to have uh, more on, uh, for example, on the role of the industry uh, in terms of regulation, for example, of online content when children um, or other uh, users produce that. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear your thoughts about that. Okay, I guess that's one for me then. So I'll, I'll volunteer anyway. The um, very interesting under the current commission is you, you may or may not uh, know. So my my commissioner is Commissioner Breton, and uh, especially during COVID, he's been very uh, public. He's had lots of sort of public meetings as well with CEOs of the big tech companies. He's been uh, in very close contact with a lot of those CEOs as well during COVID, reducing Broadstream, you know, lots of practical issues to, that have been very, very welcome and have really helped us here in Europe, I think. But I was uh, watched one event with him and Mark Zuckerberg, so just a head to head between the two of them was streamed live. And he was very clear there on really saying, you know, we say what we want. This is the internet we want that reflects our values. That's what we expect you to deliver. And obviously from his background as a CEO of you know, a very big French internet company, he has a real authenticity and certain authority when he says that. It's not just a politician, it's someone who's been sitting in that seat on the other side. So um, I think that's certainly a change of tone in some ways um, and a change of approach. We will have this year, before the end of the year, all being well, the first draft of the Digital Services Act, which is a very important piece of legislation which will sort of update or, or replace the e-commerce directive, which is the piece of legislation that really sets liability for all platforms online. So uh, this sort of says, you know, really, you're not responsible for user-generated content, but if you find user-generated content is illegal, you've got to take it down quickly. Um, and so I think we can, uh, well, obviously we'll see what that proposal brings and then see what happens when it goes through the negotiating process for, to become legislation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one change we can see. And I think also you were saying, uh, I think you mentioned also youth participation. This year on Safer Internet Day back in February, which feels a very long time ago now, um, we had a really, really interesting uh, project that we launched then. Um, bringing young people together, our Better Internet for Kids ambassadors and members of industry sort of face to face. And the idea was they would work through the summer and by our main event in November, they would have worked on a youth led pledge with young people really challenging industry to have something that was fit for purpose in terms of terms and conditions or data protection, explaining their products in an age appropriate way you know, for different ages of children and to really help them. That was recognizing them as we've heard as sort of as actors and also um, really benefiting from their expertise. Now, of course, mm -hmm. firms can do this themselves if they're serious, but we really want to try and bring them together and see how that goes. Now, obviously this has all been a little scuppered, a little mm -hmm. derailed because of COVID, but we will certainly have something in November. And I think that's certainly an interesting precedent. And if it doesn't work, quite as planned this year, it's something that we would definitely like to take forward mm -hmm. and to see how we can do that more, um, yeah, more positively, you know, in a more practical way, perhaps when we can have face-to-face -face meetings again. So I hope that partly answers those questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And it also made me think about uh, some other questions which were talking about child development, especially younger children. And I was wondering whether uh, Uwe wanted to add something, uh, having in mind his um, previous work as well on EU Kids Online on different um, ages of children. So to, to what extent can we expect children of different ages to, to self-regulate their behavior? And to what extent do we need to uh, scaffold their learning and provide a safe environment that how, how do you get to this balance? Uwe, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. Yes, from our kind of meta perspective in the core project, uh, we have to notify that um, it's one of the fallacies of our field um, that uh, there is a kind of split between the position. So either I have the position that children are not literate, that they are not agent, that they are, have to be protected, therefore I need a lot of regulation, mm -hmm. Or, on the other side, they are literate, uh, they are agents of themselves, therefore I do not know, uh, do not need uh, regulation. I can, this is a kind of typical fallacy where coming from the research perspective and research evidence, uh, the answer has to be 
quite different from that. It's not a kind of either or. We need to provide and to identify relevant empirical evidence that helps us to develop mm -hmm. meaningful regulation. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we do not have to forget that the other perspective is also there, that children are agents. So we need to provide solid empirical evidence that helps to support children in developing these kind of agencies. So it's really one of the sometimes annoying fallacies or um, gaps in, in this whole debate uh, that we are often confronted with the expectation. So let's have a decision. Do we need regulation or not? Do we just need media literacy? Then we don't need um, media regulation. And this is obviously not the wrong direction. And uh, we have to combine these perspectives, uh, each of these perspectives based on empirical evidence. Mm. Thank you very much, Uwe. Very interesting thoughts. And thinking about the, the evidence and how to support children based on this evidence, um, a couple of questions are um, quite expectedly addressing the, the COVID situation. Uh, and what have you learned uh, about um, about supporting children. Uh, probably the evidence uh, is still very new, very little and maybe piling up, but uh, from uh, your personal experiences and what evidence you've been able to, to gather, maybe it will be interesting uh, from all the projects to hear. Uh, so Riva Kalla and Lisa Wilschmidt um, answer, um, ask a couple of questions. Um, so how have children been affected? What is the impact thinking about the long-term dynamics? Uh, and also uh, what have you learned about the inequalities? Uh, and how can we transfer uh, this knowledge into improving uh, and supporting children better in the future? Could I maybe make a small uh, comment to that uh, question? Because uh, we're really concerned with, about the inequalities within our project, um, not only within as a, as a focus of the project, but also within our consortium. So we have uh, members from Estonia, from Romania, from Germany, from the UK, uh, Spain, Greece, Norway. And we've also found re really from the COVID situation a very almost a geographical kind of divide, if you could say. Uh, so in our partner in Romania has told us that about 25% of the children have had no education because they have no internet, they have no uh, support system, they have no computers. Mm -hmm. And so the, there's a stark situation that we're faced. Uh, Estonia talks about a thousand lost children. Uh, in Norway, we had, we're, we're, we're a relatively well-off country, so we had the possibility of if schools needed computers, I mean, if children needed computers or needed support, that, that, that was brought to them. Um, but we have another situation in Germany, which is a very large country, but which each of the regions are quite different. So, so the, 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 the access to and the the resources differ quite uh, quite a lot even within within a country uh, so these regional differences are really quite quite stark startling for us as a consortium and i think we need to really look at kind of best practices and how do we do that because okay, we're having a pandemic now, but we might have another one in a few years. And so how do we deal with that? How do we prepare for that? And I really think, so in, in part of our project, we've had to deal with COVID because we were supposed to be out in the field now, but it's not possible in Romania, for example. So we'll have to delay some of that research, but we've decided to do some pilot research and look at the COVID situation as part of the project, which was not planned. So we hope that we'll be able to bring some some evidence and maybe even some good practices. So Sonia, can I give uh, the, the last word to you because I think we are nearing the end of the, the seminar. Uh, and just to mention that Emerson Sutton is one of our um, audience members at the moment and is 13 years old and is going to give a speech um, in the European level about young, young people and social media and is asking what is the one thing that you would want me to say. So Sonia, maybe you can wrap up and answer this question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great challenge. Thank you um, very much. Um, and I love the question. Um, 
I think uh, COVID has made us all really think about the point that Hatla really um, developed, which is uh, the importance of recognizing diversity and indeed inequality. And it's very easy for all of us to talk as if children are all the same. We've heard a lot um, in this conversation about, uh, in this webinar, about how the differences are really, really important. Um, so I don't know if that's a that's a good point to make in a in a in a speech. Um, let's not uh, let's not treat everyone as if they are all um, the same. Uh, and the COVID challenges, the digital challenges, are all really crucial. So we do need to stop now. And um, I know there are many more questions uh, in the Q and A. We will um, collect them and um, do our best to uh, uh, respond to them after this event. Um, and this uh, webinar itself will be posted very uh, soon online. Uh, and we'll hold our next webinar in a couple of months. So, we, so please watch our, um, the space for further announcements. We are thinking um, of a future webinar on the subject of risk. Uh, no easy uh, topic there. Um, and perhaps you'll gather from some of my questions and perhaps also a webinar on the question of what is this digital world? What is, what is so distinctive and challenging about uh, theorizing the digital? So um, anyway, we have many ideas and a lot of work to do as I think everyone will have um, gathered. Uh, we're very happy if you want to tweet us your uh, suggestions for um, uh, where some of the um, work might go and there will be uh, lots of outputs from all the projects um, in the coming months so so do I, I can see that all the links are in the chat um, do please uh, watch out for what we have to contribute and last as well as thanking the wonderful participants for their questions I would like really to thank all of my uh, colleagues um, for their uh, excellent presentations um, and it's a privilege to be um, part of this work so thank you all very much and uh, goodbye <laughs>